We're going to get rolling here this morning. Good morning. Welcome if you are visiting. This is a different setup. I, I know I've said that. Some of you have heard me say that week after week for the last two months now. But I, I'm just putting myself in the spot of if you're visiting for the first time, this is weird. Right? You're coming into a, a building like this, a Canadian County Education Building. Many of you have probably been in this building for different events of different kinds. Some of you, when you were a kid, you came in here. You've probably shown animals on these facilities. I mean, it's just weird then to come in and have church. And then on top of that, to have people sitting in lawn chairs. Some of them rock. Some of them recline. You know, it's just different. This is just where we are. And so welcome to this. Um, this is a very mobile situation. Uh, like I said, we've been meeting for two months now. I think today is our eighth meeting, if I've added that correctly. So we're right at two months. And we're just kind of going week to week right now. And we're, we're putting things in place as we go. And so uh, if you are interested in staying connected with us along those lines, this is a great way to do that. You can open up your smartphone's camera, put it on that QR code, click on the link that it pulls up, and you'll get an electronic form that you can fill out. And you can give us basic contact information. That way you can get emails and we can keep in touch with you. If you have trouble doing that, just let us know and then we'll be able to do that in a manual way. That way we can get you connected. All right? All right, let's cover a few things. Tonight, we have women's Bible study tonight here, 6 p.m. This will be the last time that that Bible study is here. And so we'll keep communicating with you where it's at next. I'm sure it's probably at Malin's or, yeah. All right, but tonight here, 6 p.m., this Wednesday, the youth group, so parents of youth, youth 6th through 12th grade is what we call youth here. So they will be meeting here this Wednesday, also 6 p.m., and that will be the last time we meet here with the youth. And if you're not connected as a parent of youth, we have a group me going on, and so that would be the, the primary place to be able to stay connected. So if you're not connected, um, Casey and Janelle, will you guys raise your hand? And then Rowdy and Bailey. Rowdy's in the back. Bailey's somewhere around here too. But these are the, uh, the, the folks leading the uh, youth, and so get in touch with either one of them. But that's Wednesday this week. Um, we've got um, today after the service, if you are interested, and I would invite all of you to stick around. We're going to try to wrap some things up a little earlier today. We're going to have a brief financial committee update so that you can kind of get a better idea of where things are and where things are going. Tomorrow, tomorrow here in this building at 6.30 p.m., we are having a Passover Seder. Um, so if that's something you are interested in, many of you have signed up. Maybe you've been thinking about it. When I checked last night, I think there were 39 tickets available still. So there's still tickets available. Um, that's tomorrow, 6.30 to 9. That'll be here in this building. Um, if you have questions about that, we can visit after. But that'll be a, a great experience. That's tomorrow. And then uh, we will be after the service. We're going to, um, if you can stick around to help set up, we're going to set up for that tomorrow, which will include putting some tables and stuff out as well. All right, this one's big. Clue in. If you've already tuned me out for the morning, clue back in right now. Clue back in. This is the last Sunday we meet here. And so I've mentioned to you through some videos and through, um, through announcements that uh, we are not being able to meet here any longer past April. Um, there might be times where we can get one Sunday here every couple of months, but we are not being able to meet here anymore after April. So starting next week, we are going to be at Redlands Community College. Now, the room we're going to be in is if, if you were with us on Easter Sunday on March 31st, we're going to be in that room for now. It's not what I want. It's just what they have. And so we're going to have to meet in that room, that auditorium, you know, where you can all look down on my thinning hair and see my balding head. That room. Okay? I don't like that room. But it's one of the only rooms that will fit us also. Okay, so we're going to meet there, and um, I've asked them for um, their other conference center as soon as it becomes available, which would be more of a setup like this. Um, so as soon as it becomes available, right now they're saying probably not till after July, so currently we're planning on meeting at this amphitheater-type room through July. If it comes available early, we're moving over to that other location. But just want you to know that's something that's on the radar. We're working on, on it because I've also heard feedback, it limits us. You, you can't really linger. There's not a lot of places to be able to stand around and visit, but we're going to work, try to work some solutions on that as well. But starting next week, we are going to be meeting at Redlands, and then we'll stay in touch about uh, where we go from there. All right, last thing I have for you this morning is if today's the day you're worshiping through giving, um, there's a box over on the table by the back by the, um, the water fountains, and if you, you drop something in the box, you can do it that way, or there's also instructions if you choose to to give online. Both of those options are available for you.
All right. That's all I've got for you this morning. Let's take a moment now, as we have done each week. We, we don't want to just rush into worshiping without preparing our hearts and preparing our minds. So let's take a moment and we do that this morning. Let's come, Holy Spirit. Come and brood over us this morning. Come and make the presence of God known to us this morning. And come and give demonstrations of the power of God as we meet here this morning. Why don't you take a moment there, if there's things in your week that you feel like these are going to be a distraction to me, these are things I need to bring before uh, the Lord here this morning, keeping in mind that 1 John 1, 9 says, if we confess our sins, He is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. So if there's some things this morning you need to bring before the Lord to have your heart cleansed, go ahead and do that now. Father, would you now let your cleansing righteousness purchased for us in Christ on the cross through the resurrection, would you let that now wash over your children in this room this morning? 1 John 2 says, my little children, I write to you so that you do not sin. But if you do sin, we have an advocate with the Father Christ Jesus, the righteous one. God, I'm thankful to you that the righteousness by which we stand before you is a righteousness given to us by the one who is righteousness himself. So would you let that wash over us this morning, that we might now walk in the light, that we might come out of darkness, that we might come before you, our good and loving Father that we might receive from you this morning the things that you have for us as we gather here, the good gifts that you want to pour upon us. If there's anything that would keep us distracted, anything that's come in or that's with us that would keep us from hearing you, if there's other voices that speak to us and distract us, now in the name of Jesus, I speak to those and I command them to be silent. In the name of Jesus, that there would be no tempting, that there would be no distractions. That the only voice that we would hear would be your voice. And so teach us to hear. pray in Jesus' name. Amen. All right. If you see, we're mobile. We're just going as we go. All right. Hey, if you've got your Bibles, go ahead and grab those. We're going to open up this morning to 1 Corinthians chapter 12. 1 Corinthians chapter 12. Yeah, it sounds so much better on my left side now too. 1 Corinthians chapter 12. And we're going to look at verses 12 through 26 this morning. Now we are I think this is message number four. What we're doing is we're walking through 1 Corinthians chapters 12, 13, and 14, and then I'm going to tack on Ephesians 4, I'm going to tack on Romans 12, I'm going to tack on 1 Peter 4, because these are all places where the scriptures talk about what we call spiritual gifts. And so because this has has been a part of conversations that many of us have been in over the past couple months, these are things that we want to to look at together. We don't want to take for granted. We don't want to assume anything. 
And so if you're, if you're new with us this morning, my approach to, to things like this is this. My approach to anything on, in Scripture is this. Let's look at it. Let's see what's in the Scripture. Let's test it. And then our job is to come into alignment with Scripture, not make Scripture come into alignment with us. Now, as we are looking at things, there are times where we might be studying diligently and we come to differing conclusions. And if that's the case, then we can still pursue unity with one another while having disagreements or differing conclusions. And then the goal becomes we sharpen one another and we continue with those conversations in love and in grace. All right? Um, so that's, that's how we approach that. I'm saying all that because I understand that these are contentious topics. They can be um, topics that lead to a lot of conflict, but the very point of our, of our verses this morning is it should not lead us to division. It should not lead us to division. And so what we've looked at thus far is Paul is writing to this church who has experienced a lot of things from the Spirit, the Holy Spirit. Now, this church is made up of a lot of people who have backgrounds in other religions. And so they've got differing spiritual experiences in other religions. And so now they have become followers of the way. They have become followers of Jesus. And they're now living out uh, their, their faith in Jesus. And that comes with experiences in the Holy Spirit. So it comes with spiritual experiences. And so there's some confusion as to maybe what they should do, what might be from God and what's not from God. There's some confusion perhaps on are certain manifestations or the way that the Spirit shows up, are there certain ones that are more significant, more important, that make a person maybe more spiritual than another person? There, there's those kind of issues that are coming to play. And so the Corinthians have, have written to Paul and they've asked him questions and he's now addressing some of those questions. And so if you can picture in your mind two groups, and I don't think this will be hard to do. You picture one group in your mind, we might call them today modern day charismatics, right? People who um, they are, they're speaking in ecstatic languages and tongues and they have some, some experiences in the spirit that tend to be very physical, we might say sometimes sensational, and that's not necessarily a negative thing, but it's, it's just very upfront and very on display. And so they might be saying, hey, these experiences that we have, these are the, the higher experiences. These are the ones that everyone should be having. And if you're not having them, then we are a little bit higher up than you. They, they might not say it like that, but that's kind of the sense that might be going on. And so they're writing to Paul, and, and they're saying, Paul, will you please instruct people that these gifts, tongues and prophecy, are the two big ones in this particular congregation in Corinth, that these gifts are the higher ones, and that people who have these gifts, they're the ones who are more spiritually mature. And then you've got this other group. We might, we might say that they are not the modern-day charismatics. They might be more reserved. They might have experiences in the, in the spirit that are not as physical in their display, that are not as sensational. No doubt they experience the Holy Spirit, and the Spirit empowers them. But they're looking at these things, and perhaps they're recalling some of their past in other religions, and they're going, I saw that when I was in another religion. The priests in the other religions spoke in ecstatic languages. Only the priests in the other religions would speak things that were futuristic or that seemed to have divine knowledge. And so now I'm seeing it in the context of Christianity. Paul, will you tell them that this has no place here? And so you've got both of these groups, and, and there's, there's this tension that's in this church, and there's this division that's taking place, and Paul doesn't side on one or the other extreme. He doesn't, he doesn't, he, he corrects abuses, but he doesn't say charismatics, rein it in. He doesn't say to the non-charismatics, get on board, right? He, he's speaking to both groups and he's trying to help them say, Here, here's where you start. And this was chapter 12, verses one and three. You first need to know, does a person have the spirit? That's where we start. Does a person have the one Holy Spirit? Because if a person has the Holy Spirit, that's where we start. We need to be able to discern that. And then he went on in the verses right before this, and he says, listen, there may be one Holy Spirit, and you may be discerning that a person has that one Holy Spirit, but don't be uh, confused. There will be a variety or a diversity of ways in which that Holy Spirit shows himself off, and it will look different for different people. And so he starts to build this case that there is both a unity in the one spirit, and yet there's a diversity in both must exist. 
He's going to pick up that theme this morning, and he's going to help us out with some illustrations. And so that's where we're picking up this morning as we go in chapter 12, and we're going to look at verse 12. Chapter 12, verse 12. Here's where we're going this morning. The body of Christ, which is going to be a way that Paul refers to um, the, the gathering of believers, the assembly of believers. He's going to compare us, the scriptures often compare us to the body of Christ, must not divide over the diversity of ways the Spirit shows himself. Pretty straightforward. The body of Christ must not divide over the diversity of ways that the Spirit shows himself. All right, let's take a look. Verse 12. Verse 12. For just as the body is one and has many members, and all the members of the body, though many, are one body, so it is with Christ. For in the one spirit we were all baptized into one body, Jews or Greeks, slaves or free, and all were made to drink of the one spirit. All right, so the first thing that when you're, drop, when you're dropping in, when you're dropping into a set of verses, the first thing you've got to do is when you see a word like this, for or therefore, you, you've got to understand he's making a connection, right? He's drawing a conclusion. So you need to go back and look at the things that we had looked at last week. And so he's saying, having talked about there's a unity and a diversity, that there's many different ways in which the Spirit will show himself and display himself, and yet it's all the same Spirit, he now draws some conclusions, or he's continuing this, this explanation, and he says, for just as the body. So he's now going to give us an illustration of a human physical body. Right? For just as the body is one and has many members, you get that. But just, just, just take a moment and, and let that sink in. You've got one body and you've got many parts of that body. Arms, legs, fingers, toes, nose, mouth, eyes, ears, brain. Right? I mean, you could just keep going. But yet it's all contained in one body. There is a unity with the diversity. Okay? So he says, just as there's one body and it has many members... And all the members of the body, though there are many of them, are one body, so it is with Christ. So just like when you think about your physical body, many different parts, differing functions, they look different, they do different things. Some things are not able to do things that other things can do, right? Some things are more glorious looking than other things are, right? And yet all of those things belong to one body. Okay, that's where we're, that's the foundation. One body, and yet there's differing parts with differing functions. He says it's the same way with Christ. Now, here's what he's doing here. He's taking Christ, right? And, and, and when you hear Christ, you, you, you think of Jesus, right? And you should. Christ is the Greek word um, that translates the, the Hebrew word Messiah. It's just, this is the anointed one, right? But we oftentimes will just shorten and we'll say Christ and we mean Jesus. But here's what he's doing here. Christ now represents the whole body of Christ, all believers. That's what he's doing here. So he's saying, just as our bodies have many members and it's all still part of one body, so it is with the, and you could supply the body of Christ. So it is with the church. So it is with believers in Christ. Okay, so he's just using Christ to represent believers. Okay, so he's saying now, it's the same way. There's a unity and a diversity. Four, in one spirit, we were all baptized into one body. Jews, Greeks, slaves are free, all made to drink of one spirit. Depending on your translation, I know some of you in here are using um, New Living Translation. New Living Translation, I believe, goes with for by one spirit. Um, perhaps the NIV also does for by one spirit. And ESV and a few others do for in one spirit. There is some discussion on that. Um, it's going to go beyond the depth that we need to go in today because it doesn't affect the main point, but it does, that I'm t telling this because it does tie into some of the discussions that have led to differing denominations on this, whether one is baptized by or in, and then what follows if that's the case. Okay, so I want you to be aware of that. It might be something you want to dig into. Um, what I'm going to say to you is even though Paul's point is not really affected, if we compare how Paul speaks in other places, and if we compare other places where it talks about baptism, it seems most likely that in one spirit is the better way to go on the translation, which, which then just makes your head hurt because 
how are you in one spirit baptized in the one body? In English, it's hard to grasp, but what Paul is saying here is we are in the, in the sphere of the Holy Spirit. We are within the Holy Spirit, and because we are within the Holy Spirit, we are baptized into one body. So this is Jesus baptizes, and he baptizes with the Spirit in other places, right? So when you go through and you look at John the Baptist, he was baptizing, and he says, hey, I baptize with water for repentance, but there's one who's coming after me. He's greater than I am. I'm not even able to untie his sandal, but he will baptize you with the Holy Spirit and with fire. So Jesus is, uh, everywhere else that you look in Scripture, Jesus is the one who does the baptizing. And then the means by which or through which he does the baptizing is the Holy Spirit, or what you're baptized into is the Holy Spirit. So for in one spirit, and and I'm just going to show you that. Here's a few places. Here's Ephesians 2. This is Paul speaking another place. He says, and he came, and speaking of Jesus, he came and he preached to you who were far off and peace to those who were near. For through him, through Jesus, we both have access in one spirit to the Father. So it's through Jesus that we have access, but in the spirit to the Father. Now there you see all three of the Godhead, right? Father, Son, Holy Spirit. Jesus is the one who who gives us the access. We're connected to him. But there's something here, and I'm going to just flat out be honest with you, wrestling with this, there's more here, and I know there's more here. I can't grasp it yet. There's something here that, that is much deeper than what I am currently being able to grasp about being in one spirit. And this is where meditation on the scriptures comes in. And this is where things like this, when we talk about meditation, I'm not telling you Eastern meditation, empty your mind and try to connect with the universe. I'm telling you with, with meditation in the Bible, it's chewing on the scriptures like a cow chews cud. You digest it, you pull it back up. You chew on it some more, you digest it, you pull it back up. Incidentally, my dogs threw up last night at 3 a.m. in the morning. <laughs> and that image just popped in my head. Because then they went and swallowed it all back up. Sorry. All right. It went through my head. I thought maybe you might appreciate it too. All right, so there's, there's a depth here, all right? And, it, and it's hard to grasp, and I'm just being completely honest with you. It's hard for me to grasp what's going on here too. But it's through Jesus we have access, but it's in the Spirit, and that gives us access to the Father, all right? But what Paul is saying here is that it's in the Spirit we're baptized, and it doesn't matter whether you're Jew or Greek, so that ethnicity, okay, Jew, Greek, if you were, according to the Bible... If you look at the biblical worldview, you're either a Jew or you're a Gentile. And sometimes the way they refer to Gentiles is in the New Testament as Greeks, right? So you're either a Jew or you're a Gentile. And if you're a Gentile, that just means you can't trace your ethnicity to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, okay? So you're either or, okay? But what Paul's saying here is it doesn't matter. Your ethnicity does not matter. Whether you can trace your lineage to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob does not matter with regard to being in one spirit, baptized into the same one body. So, so the work of the spirit, the work that takes place through Jesus, transcends ethnicity. Okay? It's, it's not exclusive to just one ethnicity. Jews, Greeks, slaves are free. This would have been two social classes. This would have been um, the, maybe the elites. Um, now, when we talk about slavery, in the, this would have been under the Roman Empire, it is different than the slavery that we learn about in America. Okay, differing, differing um, it's a big discussion, but don't, don't automatically go in your mind to forced labor and enslavement of people from other countries, ethnicities, things like that. That was certainly happening at times, especially when one person conquered another. But the Roman Empire was built on the back of slaves. Incidentally, it's, it's, it's also why we, we likely don't see Paul addressing slavery as explicitly or clearly as we want, because sometimes in the, the, in the timing of God, Paul can speak in Philemon about slavery, and you can get a clear, a clear sense of where Paul stands on slavery in Philemon and through other books. But if he were to come in and just try to abolish slavery, that Roman Empire would have crumbled. There are some things that the gospel chips away at over time. And over time, it starts to erode things, and things start to shift, okay? So 
He's just acknowledging here. He's not speaking in favor of or against. He's just acknowledging that there were two social classes, broadly speaking, slaves and free. But he's saying it doesn't matter what your social class was. Whether you were a slave or you were free, the, the work of the Spirit transcends social classes. He says all of us, whether any of these groups, we were all made to drink of one Spirit. So here I've got Acts chapter 2. So when Peter stands up in Acts chapter 2 and he's speaking to the entirety of the people gathered uh, on the day of Pentecost, he quotes from Joel, the Old Testament prophet Joel chapter 2. Because what had happened was the Spirit of God came in uh, and, and the 120 people that were gathered in an upper room, um, they, were, they were all of a sudden speaking in different languages, not their own. And the people that were present were hearing them speak, each one in their own language. And there was like 10 different nations or so represented, different dialects, and they could hear them all. And so Peter gets up and he says, because they were being accused of being drunk, okay? and he says, hey, we're not drunk. This is what's taking place. Verse 16, this, what's taking place, is what was uttered through the prophet Joel several hundred years before. Here's what Joel said. In the last days it shall be, God declares, that I will pour out my spirit on all flesh. Okay, you see that, that phrase, pour out my spirit? We were all made to drink of one spirit. If you're like me, when you read drink of one spirit, you're thinking of a um, very civilized drinking from a cup. But the word that's behind here, drinking of one spirit, it can also be translated as like what you would do when you're watering your garden or you're irrigating something, so you're pouring something out, right? So to drink of, think of this, it's being dumped upon you and you're, you're drinking, so it's being poured out or it's being drunk, okay? Don't think civilized, I'm, I'm taking sips of my, my drink. All right, back to this. So the spirit's being poured out on all flesh, no distinction, no discrimination. Your sons and your daughters, there's gender shall prophesy. Your young men shall see visions, your old men shall dream dreams. So there is generations. Your male servants and your female servants, their social classes and gender. And in those days, I will pour out my spirit and they shall prophesy. So what Peter is saying is what's taking place today on that day, on the day of Pentecost, was what Joel said would take place in the last days. That the spirit would be poured out without distinction, without discrimination. It's going to transcend the, the genders, the social classes. Um, it's going to transcend all the type of categories that we tend to have set up. So when it comes to genders, both male and female, because in a society like, like what they were in, um, oftentimes many things were relegated to simply the males. And what, what Paul and what Peter are pointing out is it doesn't matter whether you're male or female, it's the same spirit that gets poured out. It doesn't matter your social class, slave or free, it's the same spirit that you partake in. It doesn't matter your generation, whether you're an old man or a young man, it's the same spirit that you're partaking in. There's no distinction, there's no second class, there's no junior varsity spirit. It is all one and the same spirit that we all take in. Okay? He says that's what's taking place. All right, let's go on, verse 14. So there's no distinction, it's poured out on everyone. Verse 14. For the body does not consist of one member, but of many. If the foot should say, because I am not a hand, I do not belong to the body, that would not make it any less a part of the body. And if the ear should say, because I am not an eye, I do not belong to the body, that would not make it any less a part of the body. So Paul goes back now to his illustration of the body, and he's taking two parts. He's taking two parts of an example here. He says, now, if you're, if you're a foot on the body... And you're looking at the hand and you're saying, I want to be the hand. And the hand seems to have important roles. And the hand seems to get things done. And the foot looks at the hand and says, well, I'm not a hand. Therefore, I'm not a part of the body. He says, if that's the, if that's the sense of inferiority that the, that the foot feels when he looks at the hand or she looks at the hand, because a foot can be a male or female, right? Okay, so if the foot should say, because I'm not a hand, I don't belong to the body, Paul says, that doesn't make you any less a part of the body just because you feel like you should be a different part. Okay? Verse 16, he takes another set of, uh, a set of body parts. Now, if the ear should say, because I'm not an eye, well, the eye gets to see everything. But the ear, the ear gets to hear things. But the ear says, I wish I could see things. And, and, and because I'm not an eye, I must not be part of the body. 
Paul says if that's the, the sense of inferiority that the ear feels when it looks at the eye, just because that ear feels that sense of inferiority, it doesn't make it any less a part of the body. He goes on and he says in verse 17, if the whole body were an eye, where would there be a sense of hearing? So you've got this ear saying, I wish I was the eye. And because I'm not an eye, I'm not part of the body. But Paul says, but if there were no ears and it was all eyes, how would the body hear? Right? If the whole body were an ear, where would the sense of smell be? But as it is, and look at this, verse 18, verse 18, as it is, God arranged the members in the body, each one of them, as he chose. If all were a single member, where would the body be? As it is, there are many parts, yet one body. Paul's driving home the same message he's been driving home for the last several verses. Same thing we looked at last week. He's driving home the same message. There is a diversity of ways in which the Spirit of God shows and puts on display His power. And the way He does it in one person will look different from the way that He does it in another person. And yet all of that can be the same Spirit working. So our job, our role becomes discerning is it the Spirit of God. Does that person have the Spirit of God? If that person has the Spirit of God, now then I need to be more open to the differing ways that the Spirit of God might show himself. But then what he's, what he's tackling in this part of our verses is a person in the body of Christ, a person among the congregation who might feel like, I want to be more like the way this person experiences the Holy Spirit. And because I don't experience the Holy Spirit in the way that this person experiences the Holy Spirit, I feel insignificant. I feel inferior. Therefore, I don't feel like I, I'm actually part of the body of Christ. Paul's speaking to that person because that right there, a sense of inferiority that leads a person to say, because I'm not like this person, because the Spirit is not showing up in my life like this person, I'm not part of the body of Christ. Now you've got division. It's just, it's more on a passive level, but you've got a division. Paul's going on and he says, here's the solution. Understanding that the way that the Spirit shows up in your life and the way, however that looks currently, it's, it's taking place in the way that God has arranged because he has chosen how he wants that arranged. Does that mean that it can't change? No, it does not mean it can't change. Does that mean that you can't ask God that he might work in your life in other ways? No, you can certainly ask God to work. We're going to get into that, as Paul says, desire the spiritual gifts and earnestly desire that you might prophesy. He's going to get into, you can ask God for other gifts, other ways the Spirit shows up in your life. But don't take what the Spirit's doing in your life now, compare it to what the Spirit's doing in someone else's life, and then allow yourself to feel inferior, and then you sideline yourself. Because as Paul says, the body needs ears to hear. The body needs feet to move and walk and hands. And, and so it, it was never intended by God that the body of Christ would be uniform. Only that the body of Christ would be in unity. But it must necessarily have diversity. It must necessarily have differences. And we talked last week about how that in and of itself is a reflection of who God is. Father, Son, Holy Spirit each a distinct person, personality, and yet the same God. One God, three persons, unity and diversity. If God himself exists as a unity and a diversity, why would we think that he wants his body, his people, to all be uniformed? This is not the military. In the military, you want consistency, you want uniformity for good order and discipline. You want everybody looking the same, talking the same, so all that can be streamlined. This is not the military. We don't want uniformity. We want unity with diversity. Okay? So Paul says his solution is this, remembering that God has chosen the members and he's arranged them as he's chosen. So his conclusion on this first part, if you're feeling inferior because you're comparing yourself, you're looking at someone else, if you're feeling inferior, there are many parts, yet it's still one body. All the parts are necessary. And so we might say it this way, a sense of inferiority does not make you insignificant in the body of Christ. A sense of inferiority, I wish I was like that person, I wish the Spirit worked in my life like that person, I, I'm an ear 
but I wish I was the eyes. A sense of inferiority does not make you insignificant in the body of Christ. Every part is needed in order for the body to function. If you feel in, uh, inferior and out of that inferiority, you start to now strive to be like somebody else or something else, then you're going to neglect what God is doing in you and how he wants the spirit to work in you. And now you might be an arm that's choosing not to work and we need the arm to work. You may be an ear that turns yourself off and we need the ear to hear what God is saying. You, you might be an eye that needs to be seeing things that the Lord is doing, but you don't like being an eye. You want to be the ear. And now we have too many people thinking they can hear from God and we have nobody seeing things. The body needs to be fully functional and healthy. And in order for the body to be fully functional and healthy, each part must carry out its role. All right, so a sense of inferiority does not make you insignificant in the body of Christ. But let's keep going, verse 21. The eye cannot say to the hand, I have no need of you, nor again the head to the feet, I have no need of you. On the contrary, the parts of the body that seem to be weaker are indispensable. And on, the, on those parts of the body that we think less honorable, we bestow the greater honor, and our unpresentable parts are treated with greater modesty, with our more presentable parts do not require. I'm going to pause right there. Okay, so now he's going after a different group. The first group was those who feel inferior because I'm not like you. I don't have the Spirit of God working in me or showing up in the same way you do. He went after that. Now he's going after the other side of this. Those who have the Spirit of God working in them in a particular way who then look at others and say, we don't need you. And so he gives, again, the example with the body. If the hand, the hand can't say, um, the eye can't say to the hand, I don't need you. So a person who sees things in the spirit, a person who is a seer, we might sometimes call this a prophet because in the Old Testament, the prophet, the word in Hebrew means seer. Okay, so a person who might be prophetically gifted in ways, who can see things, uh, who God reveals things to, if they say because of a sense of superiority to someone who's a hand, they're like a grunt, they just get things done, they're served behind the scenes, we don't need you. I can see things in the spirit. We've got these people who can see things in the spirit. We know what God's doing. We don't need you. If they were to speak like that, Paul says, you can't say that. And he gives another example, the head to the feet. The head can't say to the feet, I have no need of you. So you can draw your conclusions on, on how that might look in, in the body of Christ. But you can't have one part saying to another part, I don't need you. Because then the body doesn't function. Right? So those who feel or might think that they are superior because of the role they play can't say to those that they deem inferior that we don't need you. Why? Paul says this, verse 22. On the contrary, it's the parts of the body that seem weaker. This is how it works in God's kingdom. The parts of the body that seem to be weaker are indispensable. So the eye might, might look at the hands and go, I don't need you. Because what I've got is far more significant than what you've got. And the way the Spirit works in me is far more significant than the way the Spirit works in you. And yet, if the eye says that to the hand, what Paul says is it's the parts that seem weaker that are actually indispensable. So the Spirit reveals something to somebody who might be, say, the eyes on the body. How does it get carried out? How does the needs that might be revealed get met? How does the direction that the Lord might be leading someone or a group of someone get put into action, get executed? Not by the seer, but by the hands. Because the parts that seem to be weaker, he says, they're actually indispensable. And verse 23, on those parts of the body that we think less honorable, we bestow greater honor. So the way that it works in God's kingdom is... It might work in any other organization where you, you say people who are type A personalities, people who are highly driven, people who have a particular type of skill set, those are the people that work best in this organization. That might work for your secular, non-Christian based organization. But in the body of Christ, it's not how God works. In the body of Christ, he says it's actually, everything's turned upside down. The one that you might want to give greater honor to and then the one you want to give lesser honor to in God's kingdom, the one who receives lesser honor in your eyes actually gets more honor. And what does that do? If that's the way things start to operate, then it eliminates the division that takes place between those who are elevated typically and those who are um, de-elevated typically. Because when you start to give greater honor to those that don't typically get greater honor, what starts to happen is you don't have anybody below or above another. 
He then goes and he says, and our unpresentable parts are treated with greater modesty. This is what you are thinking it is. There are certain, taking the body, the physical body imagery, there are certain parts we cover up, or should, in polite society, in public, right, that you just don't show. And so you give modesty to those. And Paul says, <laughs> this is another one of those spots where I'm going, there's more there, Lord. I know there's more there. There are parts of the body of Christ that are unpresentable, not because they're ugly, not because they are shameful, but there are some parts of the body of Christ that here's, here's where, I, where I've gotten thus far. You don't see them because the way they're carrying out the gifting and the working of the Holy Spirit, it's covered up. It is, it is provided with some level of modesty. And you may never see those parts unless you are appropriately in a spot where you should be seeing those parts. Right? When you think about that, there's only certain people who get to see those covered up parts. I'm speaking very general right now because I'm aware that you've got kids that are going to ask you some questions, okay? But there are some people who get to see those parts appropriately. In the body of Christ, there's the same thing. There's some people that you're not going to see how the Spirit's working in their life. Um, just came to mind. Perhaps this is someone who's gifted in intercessory prayer. They have a, 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 a gift, a burden from the Spirit that He just brings people and things to mind. And that could be at all hours of the day or night. And they're praying. And yet, if they don't brag because they're not someone who posts their entire life on social media, which is a good thing, then, then you're never going to know that they were up at 3 a.m. spending time doing warfare on your behalf. Right? There are, there are parts that are hidden, they're covered up, and you may never see them, but it doesn't make them insignificant. You need them. In fact, if you take that analogy even farther, some of those physical body parts are necessary for growth and multiplication. Okay, so we keep going with verse 24. But God has so composed the body, giving greater honor to the part that lacked it, so that there may be no division in the body. What is Paul concerned about? He's concerned about what God is concerned about, that there not be division in the body of Christ. And on this topic, he's saying there should not be division in the body of Christ over the diversity of ways that the Spirit shows up. Because every way that the Spirit chooses to work and show up is necessary. You must have a diversity of ways that the Spirit of God is moving and active among the body of Christ in order for the body of Christ to be fully functional. If you are a congregation or a group of people who requires uniformity and so therefore you restrict certain ways the Spirit might show up for differing reasons, I'm uncomfortable with it, I've seen it abused, then you need to deal with those issues, yes, but you are restricting the Spirit, therefore you are handicapping the body. Okay? I shared some stories with you last week of... Um, some people who spoke what I would say are words of prophecy over me a couple weeks ago, and they were spot on, and I shared those with you. If you didn't hear those, go back and watch last week's. And that's happened for me now over the last couple of years several times, and I also told you that once some of those things started to happen, I started living from, from those in a sense. So, so we'll get more into prophecy later. They're not on the same level of scripture. But when I say I was living from those, I was recalling how God spoke through those and how it was an encouragement, how he revealed that he saw, he hears, and he's working and moving. And I reminded myself of those things as I was moving forward. Okay, now that I've experienced that kind of thing, I have no clue how I operated apart from that. I have no clue how for decades I, I operated apart from being open to that because once I experienced the ways that it encouraged, the ways that it provided guidance, the, the deepening of faith that came through a very contested way that the Spirit works, a very controversial way among uh, Christians that the Spirit works, once I experienced it in a way that was then confirmed, I don't know how I could go back to not experiencing that. I'm not going to chase it in unhealthy ways, but what I experienced was, oh, there's a part of the body that I was, I was actively saying, I don't want that part of the body. And I was not then benefiting from what that part of the body brings. Okay? Greater honor to the part that lacked it so that there may be no division in the body, but that the members may have the same care for one another. If one member suffers, all suffer together. If one member is honored, all rejoice together. What's the solution to division in the body of Christ? 
over the diversity of ways that the Spirit of God shows up. We are to be so uh, united with one another, giving honor to those things that we might feel like should get less honor. We should elevate those things and to those things that we might tend to want honor. Now, let me just put it practically speaking. So Paul's, Paul was dealing with an abuse of tongues in his congregation and people who were elevating themselves because they spoke in tongues. You know what it is for most of our circles today? Teaching. We don't necessarily, in the circles many of us have run in, we don't have a problem elevating tongues. In fact, we diminish tongues in most of the circles we run in with. You know what we do? Are guilty of elevating and dividing the church over? Teaching. Elevating people with a gift of teaching. And we put a whole lot of expectations on people who have gifts of teaching that they should not have put on them. And we elevate them almost to a papal pope status, just an evangelical pope, Right? Because we would, we would say um, they have a level of authority or they're put onto a pedestal. When that's not at all what I see in Scripture. Someone who has the gift of teaching is not to be honored more than a person who has the gift of administration or the gift of serving or the gift of mercy and compassion. But what we are guilty, and I'm just bringing this down to our level, is we may not elevate tongues in many of the circles we've been in. Some of you have been in circles where that's elevated. But many of the circles we've probably grown up in, we elevate teaching. And then we are guilty of dividing the body of Christ over teaching because we give greater honor to teaching than we do to those other what we would consider lesser. So it doesn't matter what circle you're in. You're going to be guilty if you don't actively and intentionally pursue what Paul's teaching us to pursue here. You're going to be guilty of giving honor, more honor to one part than another part. You just have to be honest about what, what part that is you're giving honor to. Okay? All right. Soapbox, step off. If one member suffers, all suffer together. If one member is honored, all rejoice together. That's the type of unity that should be taking place among the body of Christ, regardless of how the Holy Spirit shows up, regardless of whether you have one way that the Spirit works in your life and I have another. I shouldn't give in to inferiority, nor should I give in to superiority. There should be a level of unity that takes place where if you suffer, I suffer. If you feel burdened about something, I'm going to share that burden and carry that burden. If you're rejoicing about something, I'm going to rejoice with you. That's the type of unity that Paul is saying. Because if, if my arm gets cut off, it's not just my arm that's going to hurt. My whole body's going to suffer. Right? If, I, if I do things that uh, uh, cause me to be in better health, it's not just um, the legs if I'm doing leg day or whatever that's going to benefit. It's going to be my whole body. That was a plug for don't skip leg day. <laughs> okay. All right. So therefore, a sense of superiority in some does not minimize the significance of others. A sense of superiority in some does not minimize the significance of others. And this is where we started. The body of Christ must not divide over the diversity of ways that the Spirit shows himself. Seems pretty easy, and yet we know it's not. But what we're trying to do is, I said to you, what I'm pursuing, what I want to do, is be a part of a word and spirit church. A, a church that is grounded in the word of God and yet empowered by the Holy Spirit. What I, what I want to be is a church who is open to all the different ways that the Holy Spirit may work, whether it makes me comfortable or uncomfortable, whether I understand it or don't understand it. I don't want to be guilty of either actively quenching or worse, resisting the Holy Spirit. And I don't want to operate in ignorance, which is where Paul started. He says, I want you to be informed. I don't want you to be uninformed about the things of the Spirit. I want to be informed about the things that the Spirit does as it's grounded in Scripture. And then I want to be open to what the Spirit wants to do. And I think that that's the blending of a word and a spirit church. We have to be intentional about pursuing unity with that, though. It's okay if things get messy. We're not expected to be uh, polished. We're not expected to get everything right the first time. It's okay if something happens and we say, you know what, through discernment, I don't think that was the Spirit. But you know what, we don't have to be rude and go, Satan has come into this building. <laughs> and I'm not even joking about that response. Right? We, we can say, you know what, I don't think that's the way that the Spirit's working here this morning. Let's go back and seek Him on that. 
No harm, no foul. We have to create room for us to be able to learn and grow in hearing God and then practicing out what it looks like to operate in the Spirit of God in the ways that He is working. If I have the un, uh, unrealistic and burdensome expectation on me that I better get it right the first time, then I'm being actually being a hypocrite. We have to allow room for us to be able to grow. Okay, I have the gift of teaching. I get better, hopefully, over time. You, you would expect that I would practice this gift, that I would hone it, that I would do things that would help me to, to use it to the, to the utmost um, effectiveness that God wants. I'm going to sharpen the sword so that when I, when, I, when I go at somebody, it can pierce, right? I'm going to do what I can do. You would not expect me, having the gift of teaching, to get up and never make a mistake, to always hit a home run, to always communicate in perfect ways that you would understand. You allow for me to miss things or maybe to not communicate things clearly. You allow for that. But what we oftentimes are guilty of is on other gifts, we don't allow for that. We have this unrealistic expectation that on some gifts we can grow and practice in it, but in other gifts it better be right 100% of the time, the first time always. And that's not the case. But we'll get into that more in chapter 14. Let's pray. Well, Father, you are uh, wise beyond our understanding. Oh, the wisdom and depths of the knowledge of God. How unsearchable are your ways. And in your great wisdom, you have poured out your spirit upon believers in Jesus that we might be connected to Jesus that we might know life and life in the fullness. And part of what that life in the fullness is the gifts that you give to us through your spirit. Part of the way that you have in your wisdom designed us to be able to grow and mature in knowing you and in, 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 in continuing to spread the kingdom of God here on earth as it is in heaven is you've given us the empowerment of your spirit. You never expected us to do this in our own strength. It's your kingdom, therefore it's your power and your authority. And your wisdom, you've entrusted that to us. Teach us more about that. I, I ask that you would make this a, a, a body of believers who is unified and yet experiences a diversity of ways that the Spirit is working. And so even now, as I asked last week, God, I'm asking that you would pour out your Spirit here in this place on these people, that you would bestow more spiritual gifts, more ways that the Spirit of God is working among us, and that you would then teach us what it looks like to walk in those gifts, what it looks like to hear your voice and discern what's of you and what's not. God, would you give dreams and visions? Do among us whatever you want to do. And make us open to that and trusting ourselves to you. And as we come across places where we are trying to manage you, lead us to repentance in that. Because we want whatever you want to do. It won't be comfortable. It won't be even familiar at times, but we want whatever you want to do because that's the place we want to be. And we ask that in Jesus' name. Amen.